Okay, question three is not, um, it's not one uh, participant's question, it's a sort of an amalgamation of a number of participants' comments. And uh, so our mentors have, have paraphrased those comments in, uh, into, this, uh, into this amalgamated question. Here it comes. Given the instincts and how they guide us from the deep, what explains suicidal tendencies or self-destructive behavior? Similarly, how would Freud's death drive fit into this? Is there anything in the brain that would motivate irrational behavior, something beyond the pleasure principle? What is the effect of inhibiting our basic instincts? As I hope you've noticed, that's not one question. That's many questions. And what's worse, there are many big questions there. So um, I'm not going to be able to address that properly uh, without uh, really uh, uh, giving uh, another course. Um, but I'll try to get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the essence here is about irrational behavior exemplified uh, by suicide, which would seem to be the most irrational of behaviors if the guiding principle of the mind, as I'm claiming, if the guiding principle is that the mind serves the purposes, the basic biological purposes of survival uh, to reproduce. What could be more irrational in a world governed by the rule, thou shalt survive and reproduce, than to kill yourself? Um, well, let me come at that question in a roundabout way, and I'm going to pick up again on this theme of there being a distinction between the affects, the, the motivational forces of the mind, uh, and the representations which, uh, which um, uh, relate to the external world in which, in which these, uh, the, uh, the needs of the body can be met via um, our motivational um, interaction with the world and its representations. Those motivational mechanisms, the basic instincts referred to in this question, they are rational in themselves in the sense that they are designed or that they have been selected in uh, through natural selection by dint of the contribution that they make to our survival and reproductive success. But those uh, instincts then have to attach to an external world which is, which is highly unpredictable and variable. And uh, through learning, you attach the motivational force to a particular uh, a, a type of object. And there things can go awry and do. And I'll use a, a famous example, Conrad Lorenz. Conrad Lorenz, uh, who was in one of the sort of um, discoverers, if you, if you will, of, of, of the attachment bond, um, what was then called imprinting behavior, uh, he did a famous experiment with, with, uh, with geese uh, in which he took the, a, a batch of, of eggs um, uh, from which goslings were hatched. Uh, half of them were hatched in the normal way by the mother, the mother goose, and uh, as the little goslings came out of the eggs, so they looked up and saw, here's mummy, and they all started to follow her as, as goslings do with their, with, you know, you've seen the little strings of goslings all, you know, running after, after mummy goose. That's what they do. Um, but the other half of the eggs were hatched in an incubator, and the first uh, uh, living creature that they found uh, tending to them when they came out of the eggs was Conrad Lorenz himself. So what did they do? They all imprinted Conrad Lorenz and followed him around. And uh, this then stayed the same for life. So you, 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 you could uh, uh, mix all of these goslings up and, uh, in, into, a, in, you know, into a crowd, and then you put Mother Goose here, and you put Conrad Lorenz there, and they would separate out according to you know, which of those two halves they were, they were the, which of those two conditions they were hatched in. And this lot would always follow Conrad, Conrad Lorenz. Now, if you're a little baby goose um, and you're needing to attach to your mum, it's a very bad idea to attach to some funny biologist. You know, this is not the this is not uh, the, this mechanism is not designed to attach to biologists. It's designed to attach to whoever's caring for you. You know, uh, uh, at the point that you're born. In other words, mother goose. It could be a fox. You know, that's standing around at that point. And you attach to a fox and you're a little gosling. Well, you know, that's very bad news. It's much worse than a biologist. Uh, you know, you could attach to a robot. 
the point being that the content, the representational content, is not given. The instinct is. So the instinct says, I must attach to whoever's you know, around when I, when I hatch. Uh, but if the wrong thing's around when you hatch, you're going to attach to the wrong thing. A sort of slightly um, um, facetious analogy is fetishism. I mean, think about it. You get people whose whole sexual life is about stiletto heels or, you know, or worse. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be sexually attached to stiletto heels. You know, you're not going to have much reproductive success that way. But the instinct, the, 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 the sexual instinct, uh, doesn't, it, it, built into it is not what sort of object you should attach to. That depends on experience. And um, uh, you can extrapolate from the example that I've just given to the broader question that's been raised about irrational behavior. The question is, why do we have irrational behavior if we have these instincts that are designed you know, in such a rational fashion? That's how it happens. It's because the whole thing is not in the instinct. The instinct is just a kind of tool uh, which you then have to marry uh, to the world of experience in order to learn how to use that tool. And that's also for very good reasons. It's because you can't predict everything about the environmental niche that you're going to be born into. Um, that's why it has to be nuanced. Now, that's one reason why everything can't be built into the, into, the, into the instinct. The other reason why you have to have cognitions, you have to have an individualized um, ego, as the psychoanalysts call it, a, a me, uh, which is my personality that isn't born, but it's, 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 it's in fact me, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that evolves between the world that I find myself in and the instincts that I'm, that I'm born with and the feelings they give rise to. Um, is it's not only because the, the world that you're born into is unpredictable and nuanced and uh, you, know, you, you have to have flexibility for that reason. It's also that you need to have this thinking apparatus uh, because instincts can be incompatible with each other. A, an obvious example, you attach to, say, a mum, your mum. This is, this is your attachment object and you feel all of this affectionate bond toward her. But uh, the, 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 that's the attachment instinct. You also have a rage instinct. That same person that you've attached to and that you need so terribly, desperately for your survival uh, can be also the object that frustrates you and arouses your, uh, your, uh, your wrath and you want to bite her and kick her and kill her. Now you've got a conflict. You know, you've got a problem. Uh, you've got uh, the same object that you so badly need uh, is an object that you want to um, annihilate. You, 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 you've got two instincts, both of which have uh, very good um, reasons, survival and reproductive success-wise, for being there, but they give rise to two opposite um, um, motivational intentions in the real world, and uh, th these uh, uh, need to be reconciled with each other. So it's how we resolve these conflicts um, is, again, the 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 um, the sp uh, spawning ground for irrational behavior because you know there's there's no right way to do it it's a, it's a problem you've got to resolve this you've got to come up with some sort of compromise and uh, some compromises work better than others so I hope that that general principle is clear I want to now uh, uh, head towards suicide again using this concept of there being, first of all, the instinctual affective tendencies, and secondly, the representations of the objects in the world you know, that, 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 that uh, are invested uh, with these instinctual forces. We have in this representational world, as I've just said, you can have one representation of a mother that you love and another representation of a mother that you hate, and somehow these two things have to be amalgamated with each other, or not. You know, you can also have what psychoanalysts call splitting, where, you know, and I'm sure you all know it from your relationships. Uh, one day you think, oh, she's wonderful, I couldn't possibly do without her. The next day, oh my God, I can't stand you, you know, you're driving me crazy and it's the same person. Um, you feel very differently about that person at two different times. The same applies to representations of ourselves. You know, you have one picture of yourself in one emotional state driven by one instinctual uh, uh, motivational force and another one of yourself in another emotional state driven by another instinctual force. 
It sounds strange, but really it is so. You know it from your own experience that it is so, and the, 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 the um, neuroscience uh, of how these instincts and the cognitions relate to each other makes it eminently plausible. The, why I'm telling you about all of this is that in your mind, you know, the, the rageful feeling, a can that which would which is designed for your survival. It's a, there's a very good reason why you have it. It can be directed now against this person, now against that person, and the psychoanalysts call this displacement. When it if it's directed towards this person, say the mum that I love, and I can't attack her because you know I need her. Because, uh, so the rage against her gets directed against somebody else. We can do that sort of thing with the most incredible uh, alacrity, the most incredible mental gymnastics. And that leads to this apparently bizarre and irrational state where you end up attacking yourself, hating yourself, uh, doing harm to yourself, which is in fact giving expression to uh, 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 an angry feeling that was originally directed towards somebody else. But the way you resolved the conflict was to deflect it, in this case, to internalize it against some image of yourself. Now, if I'm beginning to sound like Freud, forgive me, but it really is the case that uh, you speak to people who survive suicide attempts. A very interesting thing comes out. So frequently they will tell you how they imagined, you know, why they were killing themselves was that so they could get the satisfaction of seeing so-and-so feeling such-and-such, -such, say, for example, at their funeral. But they're not there at their funeral. They're dead. And it shows you that, in fact, there's one representation that's being attacked and killed, and there's another representation that's getting satisfaction out of that. And you see, again, this whole thing about mental conflict and compromise and so on. So to bring all of this down to a simple, I hope, uh, uh, um, perspicacious statement, the instinct of aggression is itself a rational thing. It's, in other words, it serves a useful biological purpose. But it can, through cognitive processes, be uh, deflected into irrational behaviors. So instincts themselves, there is no such thing as an instinct for committing suicide. But in terms of trying to resolve all of the conflicts and difficulties that arise in relation to an infinitely complex outside world, it can end up um, uh, in a behavior like suicide. Um, now, there's, there were two further points to this question, which I just quickly want to mop up. The one was, um, what does this tell us about Freud's um, death drive? You know, is there, I'm speaking about instincts as if they're all jolly good things for survival and reproductive success, but Freud said there was a death drive. And then there's the question, is there not something that's beyond the pleasure principle? Some, are there not some behaviors which are not motivated by um, the pursuit of pleasure? You know, Freud was a very great genius. Um, there's no question about it. But, you know, Freud also was wrong about many things, inevitably. Freud was working a hundred years ago in a, in a, um, in a, at, uh, at, at a time that we really knew very little about brain mechanisms of instincts and of drives. Um, and so uh, it's no surprise that we've learned a great deal more about instincts and drives since Freud's day, and that therefore you know, we found that the, the, the conclusions that Freud came to, which are probably incorrect. Um, one of them relates to the taxonomy of these instincts. There are many more of them than Freud thought. Freud thought that there were two. And uh, Freud thought that the one was this libidinal, sort of, pro broadly speaking, pleasure-seeking sexual uh, instinct. And the other was this uh, um, unpleasure-avoiding um, not wanting to have any, tolerate any frustration, any difficulty, which is inevitably what life is about. Life is frustrating and difficult. So Freud called it a death drive, a thing that wants to just withdraw from life and all of its difficulties and go into a state of nirvana, into a state of blissful nothingness. Now, um, Freud also thought that there was a pleasure-unpleasure series, that, you know, at the one end of this um, this uh, affect regulating mechanism in our minds there's pleasure and at the other end there's unpleasure and you're somewhere along that gradient this is the pleasure unpleasure principle at any one point in time you're somewhere along this gradient and you're always trying to find as much pleasure as possible 
it's perfectly plausible that there would be two mechanisms. Uh, there doesn't have to only be one. There could be one mechanism which is a pleasure-seeking mechanism, and there could be another one which is an unpleasure-avoiding mechanism, and they don't in fact have to be you know, uh, two ends of the same gradient. Uh, and I'm, by saying that, I'm leading towards this observation, which I've already implicitly said, which is that there are actually many more instincts uh, uh, at work in the human mind and the mammalian mind than Freud thought. And uh, each of them is a, is a particular variety of pleasure and unpleasure. There isn't an overarching pleasure-unpleasure series. There are, there, are, there are multiple pleasures and multiple unpleasures, and some instincts are purely unpleasure-avoiding ones, like the rage uh, instinct, and other ones are purely pleasure-seeking uh, ones, like the seeking instinct. And um, I think that all of the phenomena that Freud um, hypothesized, or for, that Freud formulated under the hypothesis of a death drive, could be better explained, um, for example, just by saying, well, there's an unpleasure-avoiding tendency uh, in the mind, and in fact there are multiple unpleasure-avoiding tendencies in the mind at an instinctual level. And um, these better explain, um, I think, the clinical phenomena that Freud referred to um, when he formulated this, this death drive. So, for those of you not interested in Freud, I'm sorry to have said so much about that, but I hope that you can see that we do have information, data, uh, 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 that is irrelevant to the sorts of things that the, these questions are about, irrational behavior, suicide, um, you know, self-destructive tendencies and so on, um, but we, we, we're formulating them slightly differently these days. It's exciting times, uh, I think, uh, a coming together of psychiatry and psychoanalysis and so on with, with, um, with brain science, coming together with the complexities of lived life uh, on the one hand and, you know, the the uh, rigor of natural science on the other. This is what I think is exciting.